Greetings and welcome to the PowerPoint presentation for the novel Between the Cracks, One Woman's Journey from Sicily to America. And this is Carmela Cattuti, and I'm the author. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the novel, I'll just give you a, a bit of a background. Uh, it's based on a true story, and the main character, Angela, is based on my great aunt. And her story is very interesting. Um, she was orphaned by the earthquake and the powerful eruption of Mount Etna in 1908. Um, she was born and raised in Messina. In 1908, she was 10 years old. Uh, and then Angela is sent to the strict confines of an Italian convent to be raised because her family had perished. Through various twists of fate, she's married to a young Italian man who she barely knows, then together with her spouse, emigrates to the U.S. So this novel, I feel it's an invitation to accompany the young Angela as she confronts the ephemeral, ephemeral nature of life on this planet and navigates the wide cultural gaps between, let's say, pre-World War II Italy and the booming prosperity of dynamic young America because it was extremely prosperous at the time, brand new country. This novel is an homage to her, and um, she would be very proud to know that people are actually reading her story. That was her purpose in life, to get this story out. So this is a PowerPoint presentation I do at bookstores, organizations, um, other cultural centers, especially Italian cultural centers and book clubs. Um, I also do this presentation there. So this is the abbreviated version. So let's get started here. Um, I am, who am I, the great niece of the main character, and not by blood. Her husband was my grandmother's sister. So that's how she is my great aunt. And many of the minor characters were modeled on my great aunt's friends. I knew them all. And I also heard her speak to them on the phone, moving from English to Sicilian. I know their cadence. You know, I know how they speak. They're important to the novel because they give the novel a traditional Italian favor. flavor. My aunt tended to be more of an individual thinker with a unique experience. So this sets up a dichotomy in the novel, the traditional against someone who thinks outside of the box because of her life experience. I was always supposed to write her story. She needed an avenue or a conduit to tell her story so it wouldn't be lost. Very few people survived this disaster, and no one in her social circle had this experience. So she was really quite on her own in that regard. I went to Boston College as a graduate student, and it's there that I learned to write. Uh, and I also have an undergraduate degree in history, so the two meld quite nicely. And I wondered about why she had such an impact on me. Well, her presence, and as you see here on the right, she's 16, and this was taken at the convent. Her presence, she was a looming figure. She was creative, spiritual, cultural, feminine. She had a developed intuition. She was extremely kind and generous. So with all of those qualities, you got the sense her life was a great epic, and you wanted to be part of it. A lot of people did. And as you can see from this photograph, she had a touch of that unbearable beauty to her. And this is Sicily, and as you can see, Messina, up top there, it's right across from the mainland. On the right is the city of Messina, of course, post-earthquake. Uh, I think this is uh, mid-20th century. Very beautiful city, extremely cultural. Why it's important to the Italian culture? Well, Angela was not your typical immigrant because she was not the godfather story. And I think when people think about Italian immigration, that's what they think, the godfather story. Not everybody came that way. 
and you've all seen the PBS documentaries about Southern, Southern Italian immigration, well, she would never have connected with those stories. So in a sense, she was an outsider in her community. People immigrated because they were poor and came to this country to work, but really intended to return to Sicily. Most of them did intend to. They didn't because they couldn't afford to do so. Angela's story was different. Many people who came here were unskilled laborers. She came with skills, and so did her husband. So once she got here, um, she, it was easier for her to expand her social connections, and they became really, really important um, in her life. How did I come to write this book? Well, once I completed my master's at Boston College, I asked myself, what's next? I taught journal writing at an adult educational institution, and I was a journalist for a small newspaper in Boston. After a while, I disliked the journalism culture and the type of writing I was doing. Uh, so I realized at that point I was going to write Angela's story. At that, that was her gift to me. But the 1980s was a difficult time to get published. I finished the book in 1987. I couldn't get a publisher. I put it away. I picked it up again in 2007 and rewrote it for the 21st century. I connected with a friend who had a publisher, and the rest is history. And now, currently, it's going to be a trilogy. I'm working on the second and third book simultaneously. How well did I know her? Well, she was my nanny. We lived with her. Uh, we lived in a huge Queen Anne Victorian. We lived, my family lived on the upper floors, and she and her husband lived downstairs. They had no children. She couldn't have children. So we became her children. Um, my dad had died when I was seven, and um, we stayed in the house. We lived in the house. Uh, I had access to her every minute of every day. She became our primary caretaker since my mom was a professional, and she went out to work. And she also told me her entire life story. <laughs> She told me her story from when I was very small. In fact, I don't remember a time when she didn't tell me what happened to her and what she thought about it. Her experience became my experience in many ways. It was like jumping timelines. Every so often, she'd add another layer. There were things she suspected happened, so they were unspoken. She wasn't quite sure. What was unspoken kept me interested and intrigued in her story. And that was her great skill, adding layers. She was also passionate about her story as high drama. We live in a culture that frowns upon passion. Italians have great passion. But Angela's passion was not just about expressing her truth, but expressing it in a creative and elegant way. She painted a multi-dimensional layered picture with words and her presence. This is a key element in the book. She saw her life as high drama, and she was fearless in expressing it. So I think it's uh, really great to read this novel, just focusing on that, since it really has been diluted in our culture, that kind of passion. She was highly cultured, but in a universal sense. It took her about a year to learn English, and she spoke both the Sicilian and Italian quite well. Most people were attracted to Angela. In fact, very in a very short time, she became a sought-after hair dress, um, dressmaker, one of the best in town. Her clients were well-to-do Jewish women who were also immigrants. They appreciated her story, and they appreciated her talent. The southern Italian community tended to be insular. Angela found it easy and inter uh, interesting to reach out because she had this essence about her. She had this story of disaster, you know, and people were really uh, intrigued by it. She was creative, like everything she did, from creating new dresses to baking and decorating the home. All were important to her. She saw herself as representing the best of her culture, and she saw her life as a masterpiece. And that, so if you're seeing your life as a masterpiece, that means everything in your life, everything that you do. And she definitely did. 
and there were a lot of missing pieces. There was tremendous mystery to her, sto her story. Who were her parents? Um, her family had perished in the earthquake. Uh, her, well, her brother survived for a while, then he died. But her sister was never found. And that was of great angst to her her whole life, because she could imagine her sister walking the streets in Sicily looking for Angela. So it was never confirmed that she died, but most likely she was underneath the rubble, as m many people were. Um, and also, she had she was sent to Palazzo Butera in Palermo, and there was a convent there. The prince and princess of Travia in the municipality in the province of Palermo gave a building to nuns to open this uh, orphanage, and it was also a school. So she had a unique approach to spirituality that fascinated me. She prayed to the Virgin Mary. There was an altar in her bedroom because she was seriously ill a few years after she emigrated to the U.S., and she prayed to Mary to save her life. And Mary did. So every Friday, she would light candles on her altar to Mary. She was a proponent of the sacred feminine when it was not considered good form. Everyone worshipped God, but her connection was with Mary, and that was true throughout her life. So early 20th century Sicily, uh, I wanted to look at the backdrop and the society she came from, because I think this enhances the reading of the novel. You get bits of it in the novel, but not all of it. Uh, the political climate, uh, Sicily had been conquered by the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Muslims, the Normans, the Spanish, the Bergen. Everybody co conquered Sicily. They left their art and they left their customs. Italy was unified in the 1860s. There was a new constitution, but the new constitution favored the North. Their tax policies were fierce and enforced, and there was a lot of military interference. There was, was a revolt in Palermo in 1894. The city was bombed. Uh, Angela was born in 1898, so that was not her experience, but she, I'm sure she felt the residual tension of that. And there were religious issues. Sicilians are actually tongue-in-cheek about the church. They had more of a folk religion that had little to do with formal dogma or rituals. Unlike Irish Catholics, who respected priests, Italians were suspicious of the church. Many su the church supported the aristocracy, who kept them down. So many of the priests were connected to the suppression of Southern Italians. And next is cultural mores. There was a lot of unrest. Upper classes' disdain for the common folk was prevalent. They had an economic investment in keeping the poor poor. So a lot of class issues. Poverty and social unrest. There was a lot of rebellion of the lower classes and military action to suppress them from the north. And women, the, the, it's just not a safe place for women. They couldn't take paid work. Their activities were confined to the home. There were strict rules l limiting their public behavior, including their access to education and outside influence. There were formal rituals of courting, lots of chaperonage and arranged marriages. Uh, you know, the, the relationship between the sexes was strictly governed. So protection of female chastity was crucial to maintaining family honor. Uh, migration and settlement in other countries operated with a context of family considerations. So entire villages moved, immigrated together. They maintained the same kind of cultural mores. Uh, social climate was one of suspicion of one's neighbor. So there was very little support. And out of that, here we are, December. 28th, 1908, 5.20 a.m. We have the earthquake. Everybody was asleep. And here's some of the, this is the aftermath of the earthquake. And it was followed by a tsunami with aftershocks. 
Messina, there are different numbers about this. Messina was a population of 150,000. Hundreds were left. Um, Americans came, many countries came to help, to assist, but uh, help was slow in coming. This is early 20th century. <laughs> it was slow. So what happened after that? Angela was sent to a convent in Palermo. This is a Saint Vincent de, Vincent de Paul nun. These are a French order of nuns. Angela got an education and developed her talents. She became a popular girl and met many different types of people. It was also a school for well-to-do girls, local well-to-do girls. Uh, went to school there. If you wanted an education, you had to go to a convent. And she made new connections, Princess Julia of Palermo. Uh, she took a great interest in my great aunt. She took a great interest um, in her sewing. They, the building was in Palazzo Butera, and she and her husband Pietro were custodians of the estate. Uh, they, uh, the Julia primarily took a great interest in her. But what I found out um, that later was that Pietro di Trabia, her husband, Julia's husband, his last name was Lanza. And my great aunt's last name was Lanza. And she was from Pol uh, Messina, and there was an orphanage there, but she ended up in Palermo under the guidance of Pietro and Julia uh, di Trabia. So I'm researching uh, that last name, trying to see if, if there's any connection between them and my great aunt. Um, she, my great aunt had a wedding reception at the Palazzo. So I thought that was strange too. My aunt said that she was just fond of Angela. She was beautiful. She was talented. She liked her designs. But I'm continuing uh, to research that. And Princess Julia sent my aunt a telegram expressing her disappointment at not being able to attend her wedding. So she was also going to attend her wedding. And here is the uh, document itself. Here is the telegram. For those of you who read Italian, you can just you can enlarge it and see what it says. And this is Angela's home in the New World. They bought this in the 1930s. She had emigrated to the U.S. in 1914. They owned several houses. They continued to own those homes and rented them out to other Italians, and they bought a huge Queen Anne, Victoria. I was raised in this house. The top floor was our residence, and the bottom floor was my great aunt's and her her husband. Um, they, yeah, they lived in smaller houses prior to that, and the rental properties brought them money. Uh, so they were very good business people. And this is St. Mary's School. When my aunt came to the U.S., she quickly got a job sewing at St. Mary's Episcopal School and Convent. So my uncle worked there as well. He was an electrician, a carpenter, uh, kind of a handyman. She had tremendous respect for the nuns. Her experience there was a positive one. It was a boarding school for uh, students. She had a wonderful relationship with the students. She made the graduation dresses. And um, my uncle also worked there during that time. So she developed a wonderful relationship with the nuns, and they liked her very much. And the quality of her work, of course, was quite high. Angela, 1980s, that's myself and my great aunt. Um, this is, she was in her 90s, so she was quite well preserved. In conclusion, I think her life was a lesson in how to approach circumstances outside of yourself and be successful at doing so, regardless of the odds. It's also a lesson in how to approach your own spirituality, reaching outside of yourself for connections, and to never forget your history, but integrate it into your present life and always share who you are. So, we don't have a Q&A. If you'd like to purchase the book, Amazon, uh, Goodreads, and this is the, my blog, so I post updates about the upcoming novels and other things. 
And this is me. This is my bio. And if you'd like to email me, it's right there. So if you have a book club or an organization and you'd like to come and have me present the book and do a book signing, just email me and I will get back to you. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. And I hope you buy the book. And if you do, please e email me with any and all comments. Thank you very much.